permission, I'd like to make a statement on new measures to keep this country safe from coronavirus. Thanks to our collective efforts, we're turning a corner. Cases of coronavirus have fallen 47% in the last two weeks, and they're falling in all parts of the UK. But we're not there yet. Hospitalizations are falling, but there are still many more people in hospital than at the April or November peaks, and the number of deaths whilst falling is still far too high. Our vaccination programme is growing every day. We've now vaccinated over 12.2 million people, almost one in four adults in the United Kingdom, including 91.4% of people aged 80 and above, 95.9% of those aged between 75 and 79, and 77.2% of those aged between 70 and 74, who were the most recent groups to have been invited. And we've also vaccinated 93.5% of eligible care home residents. We've made such progress in protecting the most vulnerable that we're now asking people who live in England, who are aged 70 and over and haven't yet had an appointment to come forward and contact the NHS. And you can do that by going online to nhs.uk or dialing 119 or contacting your local GP practice. So we can make sure that we reach the remaining people in these groups, even as we expand the offer of va a vaccine to younger ages. Mr. Speaker, these are huge steps forward for us all, and we must protect this hard work for progress by making sure we stay vigilant and secure the nation against new variants of coronavirus that put at risk the great advances that we've made. Mr. Speaker, coronavirus, just like flu and all other viruses, mutates over time. And so responding to new variants as soon as they arise is mission critical to protect ourselves for the long term. We've already built firm foundations like our genomic sequencing, which allows us to identify new variants, our testing capacity, which allows us to bring in enhanced testing wherever and whenever we find a new variant of concern and our work to secure vaccines that can be quickly adapted as new strains are identified. Our strategy to tackle new variants has four parts. First, the lower the case numbers here, the fewer new variants we get. So the work to lower case numbers domestically is crucial. Second, as I set out to the House last week, is enhanced contact tracing, surge testing, and genomic sequencing. We're putting this in place wherever a new variant of concern is found, in the community, like in Bristol, Liverpool, and as of today, Manchester. Third is the work on vaccines to tackle variants, as set out yesterday by Professor Van Tam. And fourth, health protection at the border to increase our security against new variants of concern arriving from to abroad. And Mr. Speaker, I'd like to set out to the House the new system of health measures at the border that will come into force on Monday. The new measures build on the tough action that we've already taken. It is, of course, illegal to travel abroad without a legally permitted reason to do so. So it's illegal to travel abroad for holidays and other leisure purposes. For the minority who are traveling for exceptional purposes, they will be subject to a specific compliance regime and end-to-end -end checks throughout the journey here. Every passenger must demonstrate a negative test result 72 hours before they travel to the UK. And every passenger must quarantine for 10 days. Arriving in this country involves a two-week process for all. We've already banned travellers altogether from the 33 most concerning countries on our red list where the risk of a new variant is greatest unless they're a resident here. But even with these tough measures in place, we must strengthen our defences yet further. I appreciate what a significant challenge this is. We've been working to get this right across government and with airport operators, passenger carriers and operational partners, including Border Force and the police. I want to thank them all for their work so far. And we've been taking advice from our Australian colleagues, both at ministerial level and from their leading authorities on quarantine. The message is everyone has a part to play in making our borders safe. And I know this is a very difficult time for both airlines and ports, and I'm grateful to them for working so closely with us. You have such an important role to play in protecting this country. 
and putting in place a system so we can securely restart travel when the time is right. The whole team at the borders working together. Mr. Speaker, let me set out the three elements of the strengthened end-to-end -end system for international arrivals coming into force on 15th of February. This new system is for England, and we're working on similarly tough schemes with the devolved administrations and working with the Irish government to put in place a, similar, a, a system that works across the common travel area. The three parts are as follows. Hotel quarantine, testing and enforcement. First, Mr Speaker, we're setting up a new system of hotel quarantine for UK and Irish residents who've been in red list countries in the last 10 days. In short, this means that any returning residents from these countries will have to quarantine in an assigned hotel room for 10 days from the time of arrival. Before they travel, they'll have to book through an online platform and pay for a quarantine package costing £1,750 for an individual travelling alone, which includes the hotel, transport and testing. This booking system will go live on Thursday when we'll also publish the full detailed guidance. Passengers will only be able to enter the UK through a small number of ports that currently account for the vast majority of passenger arrivals. When they arrive, they'll be escorted to a designated hotel, which will be closed to guests who aren't quarantining for 10 days or for longer if they test positive for COVID-19 during their stay. We've contracted 16 hotels for an, an initial 4,600 rooms, and we will secure more as they are needed. People will need to remain in their rooms and, of course, will not be allowed to mix with other guests, and there'll be visible security in place to ensure compliance alongside necessary support. So even as we protect public health, we can look after the people in our care. Second, Mr. Speaker, we're strengthening testing. All passengers are already required to take a pre-departure test and cannot travel to this country if it is positive. From Monday, all international arrivals, whether under home quarantine or hotel quarantine, will be required by law to take further PCR tests on day two and day eight of that quarantine. Passengers will have to book these tests through our online portal before they travel. Anyone planning to travel to the UK from Monday needs to book these tests and the online portal will go live on Thursday. If either of these post-arrival tests comes back positive, they'll have to quarantine for a further 10 days from the date of the test and will of course be offered any NHS treatment that's necessary. Any positive result will automatically undergo genomic sequencing to confirm whether they have a variant of concern. Under home quarantining, the existing test to release scheme, which my right honourable friend, the Transport Secretary, has built so effectively, can still be used from day five, but this will be in addition to the two mandatory tests. The combination of enhanced testing and sequencing has been a powerful weapon through this pandemic, and we'll be bringing it to bear so we can find positive cases, break the chains of transmission, and prevent new cases and new variants from putting us at risk. Third, Mr. Speaker, we'll be backing this new system with strong enforcement of both home quarantine and hotel quarantine. People who flout these rules are putting us all at risk. Passenger carriers will have a duty in law to make sure that passengers have signed up for these new arrangements before they travel and will be fined if they don't. And we'll be putting in place tough fines for people who don't comply. This includes a £1,000 penalty for any international arrival who fails to take a mandatory test, a £2,000 penalty to any international arrival who fails to take the second mandatory test, as well as automatically extending their quarantine period to 14 days, and a £5,000 fixed penalty notice, rising to £10,000 for arrivals who fail to quarantine in a designated hotel. We're also coming down hard on people who provide false information on the passenger locator form. Anyone who lies on the passenger locator form and tries to conceal that they've been in a country on the red list in the 10 days before arrival here will face a prison sentence of up to 10 years. These measures will be put into law this week, and I've been working with the Home Secretary, the Border Force and the police to make sure the resources, more resources, are being put into enforcing these measures. I make no apologies for the strength of these measures because we're dealing with one of the strongest threats to our public health that we've faced as a nation.
I know that most people have been doing their bit, making huge sacrifices as part of the national effort. And these new enforcement powers will make sure their hard work and sacrifice isn't undermined by a small minority who don't want to follow the rules. Mr. Speaker, in short, we're strengthening the health protection at the border in three crucial ways. Hotel quarantine for UK and Irish residents who visited a red list country in the past 10 days and home quarantine for all passengers from any other country. A three test regime for all arrivals and firm enforcement of pre-departure tests and the passenger locator form. Our fight against this virus has many fronts. And just as we're attacking this virus through our vaccination program, which is protecting more people each day, we're buttressing our defenses against these vital measures so we can protect the progress that we've worked together so hard to accomplish. And I commend this statement to the House. I'm now going to call the Shadow Secretary of State, Jonathan Ashworth. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Secretary of State for advance sight of his statement. And I again start by congratulating all involved in the vaccination rollout. Vaccination needs to reach everyone. Uh, and we need to drive up those vaccination rates amongst the over 70s. There have been some reports today that over 70s have been ringing up to get an appointment, but the NHS computer systems are not yet uh, uh, ready to accept appointments over the phone. Could he look into that for us? And what is the plan also to drive up vaccination levels in minority ethnic communities? I'm sure he's as worried as I am about the uh, vaccination rates amongst diverse communities. I know the government announced some funding for local authorities to tackle vaccine hesitancy in minority ethnic communities, but a city like Leicester, mine, one of the most diverse in the country, was not on the list. Can he rectify that? At last night's press conference, he said that the way we deal with new variants is to respond to them as they arise. The first line of defence is to identify and stop spread. But our first line of defence is surely to do everything we can to stop them arising in the first place. That means securing our borders to, to isolate new variants as they come in. He's announced a detailed package today, but he hasn't announced comprehensive quarantine controls at the borders. So why then, when over half of countries where the South African variant has been identified, why are half, over half of them not on the so-called red list? And indeed, according to newspaper reports, he wanted to go further with more extensive quarantine ar arrangements. I want that as well. The British public want that as well. So I will work with him to make that happen so that we can strengthen our borders and fix any holes in this nation's defences. Now, as he knows, mutations occur as long as the virus can replicate and transmit. And the greater the spread, the greater the opportunity. We have the South African variant. We have the so-called EEC E484K mutation in the B117 strain has been identified as well. Isn't the cold reality that the virus is now here for some time? And therefore, for vaccines to succeed in protecting us, we need to do more to protect those vaccines by cutting transmission chains and spread, especially when lockdown eases. Now, last year, the Secretary of State said in launching Test and Trace that it would help keep, up, keep this virus under control while carefully and safely lifting the lockdown nationally. But it didn't keep the virus under control, did it? So how will it be different this time? Will retrospective test tracing, the enhanced tracing he's outlined for areas where there are variants, will it, that be routine everywhere? And extra testing where there are variants is, of course, welcome. But for many who can't work from home on Zoom calls and laptops, who are poor or low paid, who live in overcrowded housing, or perhaps are care workers who are currently using up their holiday entitlement when sick, so not to lose wages, a positive test it's not just a medical blow, but a financial one as well. Last Tuesday, he boasted of the £500 payment, yet over 70% of applications financial for financial support are rejected. By Wednesday, his own head of test and trace was pointing out that 20,000 sick people a day don't isolate. And indeed, two months earlier, Dido Harding had already said, people are not self-isolating because they find it very difficult. They need to keep earning and feed... The need to keep earning and feed your family is fundamental. So is it any wonder that infections are falling at a slower rate in the most deprived communities? We need that financial support that his own scientific advisors have called for, has been shown to work internationally. But he, and if he thinks I am wrong, 
Can he tell us why he thinks Dido Harding is wrong? Secondly, we know this virus can be transmitted through aerosols. Has he looked at installing air filtration systems in public buildings, such as schools? And given concerns that the new Kent variant may shed more viral load through coughing and sneezing, will he update the guidance on face masks, as Germany has done, with FFP2 masks in pub on public transport and in shops? And will he ensure higher grade PPE for frontline NHS staff becomes a requirement as the BMA, RCM and unions have called for? Finally, Mr. Speaker, next week is Children of Alcoholics Week, a cause that is very close to my heart, Mr. Speaker, and indeed I'm going to be running the London Marathon again to raise money for an alcoholics charity, if it's on. Uh, I'm looking forward to the Secretary of State assuring me that it's going to be on, and perhaps he can run it with me. Um, but the excess deaths from liver disease from this pandemic are up 11% in the pandemic. It's a huge increase in excess deaths from liver disease. And many children are in lockdown in homes under the shadow of alcohol abuse. Will you look at providing more support for those organisations that are helping children through this difficult time of lockdown who are dealing with parents with substance misuse problems. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I, I was listening very carefully to the honourable gentleman, uh, and I think I take that as support for the measures that we're bringing in. Um, on the specific points that he raises, um, he's absolutely right that further driving up vaccination rates is critical. I'm delighted by the vaccination rates and the uptake of over 90% in all of the uh, groups uh, over the age of 75 and rapidly rising now above 75% uh, in the 70 to 74s uh, and rising fast. So I agree with him very strongly on the need to keep driving up the uptake of the vaccine. Uh, and the Minister of Vaccine Deployment, Minister Zahawi, is leading the efforts across with the NHS uh, and local authorities uh, to try to make sure that we can increase vaccination rates further. But nevertheless, this take up uh, has been absolutely uh, superb so far, and there's still more to do. Uh, I'll absolutely look into the uh, points that he made uh, about uh, Leicester. I know that it's close to his uh, heart uh, and a very important, uh, a very important matter. Um, I I'll also commit to him to keeping the red list up to date. It is important that we take the measures that are necessary to protect this country. There are countries around the world on a so-called green list uh, that have very, very low rates of, of, uh, of infection uh, and no known variants of concern. So uh, I, I'm absolutely uh, in favor of keeping the red list up to date, uh, but I also think that it's important that we're proportionate when there are countries uh, that have uh, that do not have a record of uh, a variance of concern. However, we will use the fact that we'll sequence every positive test from somebody who comes through the border uh, as a global system of vigilance uh, to make sure that we are always looking for those variants of concern. He raised the issue of financial support, uh, and I reiterate the point that the £500 support uh, is available for anybody on low incomes, so people should come forward for testing in all circumstances, and I'm absolutely delighted at the level of testing as well, where there's now an average of, uh, of over 650,000 tests a day done in this country, uh, which is obviously a very, very uh, substantial number. He raised the point about air filtration systems, which are important, and I'll point him to guidance from the business department on air filtration systems and on PPE, where we have taken clinical advice uh, and follow the clinical advice on the correct levels of PPE. And finally, I know that the issue of children of alcoholics is very close to his heart and many colleagues across this house. And so I will absolutely look at how we can ensure that the extra funding that we have provided in this space uh, it, it continues to support the vital work uh, of those, not just in the NHS, but also especially charities who do so much uh, in this space. Um, I, I, the, um, the, the invitation to run the marathon with him uh, Mr. Speaker, is a, uh, uh, is a very interesting one. Um, I'm not sure I've got enough time for training this year, uh, and, but it's certainly something I'd like to do at some point in the future. Let's head to the chair of the select committee with Jeremy Hunt. Jeremy Hunt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I strongly support the new measures. 
the higher the number of new daily cases, the more opportunities for variants and mutations to emerge, including ultimately some that may be immune to the vaccine. So does the Health Secretary agree that the central priority now must be to bring down the number of new daily cases? And as we do that, is he planning to introduce enhanced contact tracing for all new cases, including Japanese style backward contact tracing and genomic sequencing of every new case? Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have the biggest genomic capacity in the world by some margin. And when the number of cases comes down, as our genomic capacity continues to expand, and we plan to more than double it in the coming months, um, then I hope to get to the position where we can genomically sequence every positive case. Yes, uh, but we're not there yet. Um, the, the, the strategy that I outlined to tackle new variants, of which the border measures is an important part, is itself one part of the four conditions that the Prime Minister set out for when we can lift measures. Uh, the other three being the successful rollout of the vaccine, which is going very well, uh, the, the fall in the number of hospitalizations and the fall in the number of deaths, both of which, as I said, are moving in the right direction, but still too high. Uh, and therefore, this strategy to tackle new variants is crucial. Um, and the number of cases is a factor because it itself determines the number of new variants. But the conclusion of all of that is that we must all stick to the rules now. And the more that we stick to the rules now, the sooner we can get out of this. Let's head to SNP spokesperson in the north with Martin Day. Martin Day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The South African variant is a sure warning sign of the risk from other mutant strains which may be out there. When combined with the question mark over vaccine efficiency with this variant, it is clear why we need effective border restrictions. So can the Secretary tell me why there are 35 countries where the South African and Brazilian variants are present and are not on the quarantine red list? Does the government have a plan to redress this gap? Now, from a government obsessed with taking back control over its borders, this omission is surprising. The Prime Minister has previously said that the UK cannot emulate other island countries such as New Zealand or Australia in preventing all unnecessary travel into the country due to the amount of food and medicine the UK imports. Today's change of heart is indeed welcome. Can the Secretary confirm how these measures will keep the flow of goods and those transporting them open while restricting travel not related to import and export of goods? Thank you very much. Well, the, the measures I've outlined today relate to passenger travel. There is, of course, a testing regime already in place for accompanied freight. And there is a difference between this country uh, and uh, Australia and New Zealand, and that is that accompanied freight is a significant proportion of our uh, daily imports, uh, including um, just-in-time delivery, for instance, of, uh, of food. Um, whereas for islands that are further away from a continent, then unaccompanied freight is a much, much more significant proportion of their international imports. Um, so we have to take these practical considerations into account. Uh, as I said, um, Mr. Speaker, we keep the red list of countries under review and the extra testing measures that I have outlined today will help us with that vigilance so that we can see where variants of concern are and to what degree they're present in other countries around the world. I said, remaining in the north with Peter Gibson, Peter Gibson in the northeast. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank my right honourable friend for his announcement today? The people of Darlington and right across the northeast have made incredible sacrifices to tackle this virus. And I know that they will welcome the tough pressures. He has announced for those that seek to avoid quarantine. Does he agree with that it is mass testing, vaccination, following the rules, and tough sanctions for those who break the rules that will help us to tackle this virus. I got it. Thank you very much. Um, I agree with my honourable friend uh, that it is a combination of the mass testing, the vaccinations, and the tough enforcement that is not only right to deal with this virus, but as he says, it is fair for people who are doing the right thing. And that is why 
the, I think, the enforcement measures to ensure that everybody follows the rules because this virus attacks us all as humans and it doesn't treat people differently just because they're better off and might be able to fly to Dubai for the weekend. It treats us all the same, so we should treat people the same. And I think that is one of the reasons that it is important to bring these measures in with strong enforcement so that they are both tough and fair on people who are working so hard and sacrificing so much to follow the rules. To Panath with Stephen Doherty. Stephen Doherty. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I simply don't understand the logic being used for the red list with countries where dangerous variants present not included, and multiple back doors left open. I've watched passenger flights over the last few days, including a flight from Peru on the red list, currently en route to the Netherlands, which isn't on the red list, but has substantial connections to the UK, and flights from countries in southern African red list countries en route to hubs in Addis Ababa, Nairobi and so on, again with substantial onward connections to the UK, but who aren't on the red list. We've even heard about UK troops in Kenya testing positive for COVID today. So will the Secretary of State publish the epidemiological data that's being used to take those decisions on which countries are included and urgently review some of the very serious inconsistencies that exist? Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The, the, uh, the Honourable Gentleman raises an important point and these points are addressed in what I've just announced in two ways. The first is that anybody who has been in a red list country in the past 10 days must declare it on a passenger locator form and to fail to do so is going to be an imprisonable offence. Um, and of course, if nobody can come directly from a red list country anyway because those flights have been uh, stopped. Um, and this is a critical part of the enforcement of this uh, system. Um, in addition, the second point he raises is important, which is that there are some countries where a variant of concern is the dominant variant, uh, including in, for instance, uh, Southern Africa and in, uh, in parts of Brazil. Uh, there are other countries where there are very small numbers of variants of concern, uh, in the same way that here in this country, thankfully, there are very, very small numbers of variants of concern. So absolutely, we, uh, we publish information uh, on a very broad scale, uh, but we have to make these, uh, the judgments on what's on the red list and we'll keep it under review. The final point I'd say is that, uh, is that different countries have very different levels of genomic sequencing. There are some countries, even developed countries, that have very low levels of genomic sequencing. Uh, we, are, we offer to support all countries around the world uh, to make, if they want a, a sample sequence, then we will do it for them in order to help with this, uh, this vigilance. Uh, but the mandated testing arrangements that we've introduced today will help, that we, help ensure that we can strengthen the epidemiological uh, data on which the judgments about, about the red list are taken. Let's head to the southwest with Selene Saxby. Selene Saxby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Cases here in North Devon are now down to just 25 per 100,000. What reassurance can my right honourable friend give that when the time comes to unlock, the hard work of the people of North Devon will not be undone by an influx of visitors, either from home or abroad, with new variants? And are options being looked at for local unlocking to enable schools to reopen and some local businesses to restart, given the very low level of community transmission here? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to see that there are some parts of the country where the case rate really has come down uh, a long way, down to uh, 25. Um, it, it, it is important for us to make sure that we get these levels down across the country. And we've seen before that when there are areas that are low, um, the, there, is, there is spread from elsewhere in the country. Actually, the experience of last summer was that Tourists travelling to go on holiday within the UK uh, did not uh, contribute to an increase in levels. Um, it, was, it, it was when levels elsewhere got really much higher that we then saw the transmission to other parts of the country. Um, and um, those, it, it's those, those judgments that will inform the roadmap proposals that the Prime Minister will set out on the 22nd of February. I wish I could say more in more detail to my honourable friend but it's for the Prime Minister to set out later this month. But, uh, remaining in the South West with Curran Smith. Curran Smith. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The news of the new mutation is obviously of great concern to the people of Bristol, but they have locally, the public health officials have rapidly set up new testing centres and today new five drop and collect testing centres. It is a massive effort locally. Hundreds of people have come forward voluntarily since Sunday to be tested. Will the Secretary of State join with me to thank those public health officials locally here in Bristol and the people who have come forward and join with me in encouraging more people in those areas of that we identify those postcoded areas to come forward for this surge testing to help us understand this virus better? Mr Speaker, I agree with every word that the Honourable Lady has said and this is, a, this is an incredibly important effort by the people of Bristol, especially the postcodes that were identified uh, and I want to thank all the public health officials at Bristol City Council and more broadly, including uh, South Gloucestershire, and say to them that the work they're doing to tackle the variant of concern where it is found, even though the numbers are small, we want to tackle every single one that we find uh, and really get this uh, under control. As you can see from this exchange, Mr Speaker, and as everybody in Bristol can see, this is a cross-party, cross-community effort in which everybody has a part to play, and I thank the Honourable Lady for her leadership. Let's head to the West Midlands with Suzanne Webb. Suzanne Webb. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I welcome the statement today, and I am so proud of all my constituents across Stourbridge, Craig and Lye, in the way they have fully understood and taken on board that we all have our role to play in defeating this virus. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that the constant flip-flopping and reliance on hindsight by the party opposite is nothing more than seeking to only score political points rather than reinforcing the government's message that we all have a part to play to defeat this virus? And those on the opposite benches would be well served following the fine examples set by I think I, I think that I think that what the public want to see in Starbridge and across the whole United Kingdom is people working together to defeat this virus. Some of the measures have to be tough and some are difficult, but it is all done with the goal of getting this country through this as well as we possibly can so that we can lift as many measures as soon as we safely can. And that balance between pace and safety is absolutely central to the judgments ahead. I want to thank everybody in Stourbridge and say to them, this, there is no politics in this. The only thing that's important is the safety of the people of Stourbridge. Let's uh, back to London with Russia Narali. Russia Narali. Thank you, Mr. De Mr. Speaker. I'm grateful to all those working together, the GPs, Queen Mary University, the Royal London Hospital, Tower Hamlets Council, the London Muslim Centre and others in my constituency to make sure people get vaccinated. But vaccine take up, as you've heard, is lower among minority communities and some other vulnerable groups. 77% of white residents are getting vaccinated, which is great, uh, but only just over half of Asian and under 46% of black residents in our borough are getting vaccinated. So can the Secretary of State commit to increasing the supply of vaccines to our GP surgeries as they are saying that this is where they can make a big difference with vaccine take up. It would make a big difference to the death rates and the dangers that these minority communities face in my constituency and elsewhere in the country. Secretary State. Mr. Speaker, I want to praise the Honourable Lady for the leadership that she is showing uh, locally in driving up those vaccination rates. The fewer people who are left unprotected by the jab, the safer we will all be, both individually and in. Uh, communities in London and across the country. Um, my honourable friend, the Minister for Vaccine Deployment, Minister Zahawi, uh, is leading the efforts in this space, and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that uh, he gets in contact so that we can work together to reassure everybody that the vaccine is the right thing for you and the right thing for your community. Good Merriman. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and uh, can I welcome the rollout of the vaccine programme? It's been a great success, and I congratulate the Secretary of State. Can I just ask for a bit of clarity on the statement? Firstly, uh, the Secretary of State states under the home quarantine, the ex existing test release scheme can still be used from day five. Does that mean that somebody can successfully test day five, sorry, they would test negative, are then free to interact in the community for those three days? 
still have to take another test at day eight, in which case, if they fail that test, they have to quarantine again. That's the clarity. And secondly, how long is this likely to last for? Obviously, the summer travel uh, is so important to the aviation industry. Is this just to last until we've vaccinated 99% of the mortality risk, which should be by May? Or is it until we tweak uh, the um, vaccination, in which case this could really, really have an impact on the aviation industry? Uh, thank you very much. On the first uh, point of clarity he seeks, he's, he's stated the position exactly correctly. Uh, on the second point, uh, we want, of course, to be able to exit from this into a system of safe international travel as soon as practicable and as soon as is safe. Uh, Professor Van Tam uh, last night set out some of the details that we need to see in the effectiveness of the current vaccines on the variants of concern in order to have that assurance. Uh, and if that isn't forthcoming, then we will need to vaccinate with a, uh, with a further booster jab in the autumn on which we're working with the vaccine industry. Uh, these are the uncertainties within which we are, uh, we are operating. Uh, and hence, for now, um, my judgment is that the package that we've announced today is the right one. Let's head over to Manira Wilson. Manira Wilson. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Many of us have been urging the government uh, for about 12 months now to take stronger action at our borders. So these measures announced today are very welcome, but ministers have been consistently slow on this issue. With the ONS estimating today that tragically COVID deaths in the UK have now surpassed 125,000, how many of those deaths does the Secretary of State believe could have been prevented by imposing much stricter public health measures at our borders since last March? Well, we've had, we've had significant measures at the border uh, throughout, and the new stronger measures are necessary because of the uh, the arrival around the world of new variants of concern at the same time as the vaccine rollout is progressing successfully. And we don't want the very successful vaccine rollout to be, uh, to be undermined. Um, and th therefore, it's reasonable to take a precautionary approach to, the, to international travel now, whilst we assess the effectiveness of the vaccines, which we are clear uh, is they have some effectiveness uh, the question is a matter of the degree, uh, and that is currently being tested right now. Let's head to Neil O'Brien. Neil O'Brien. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, given the incredible success of the UK vaccination programme, it would be terrible to put at risk our opening up by importing new variants like those seen in Brazil. So will my right honourable friend stand ready to further tighten up the measures at the border and the enforcement of quarantine? And does he agree with me that if we want to see rapid opening up, as we all do, then we should be supporting strong measures at the border. My, my own friend is right that, firstly, we must keep the red list under review. But secondly, this crucial point that strong protections on, at the border are part of defending and uh, safely allowing the domestic opening up. And for those of us who want to see that domestic opening up, ensuring that we have uh, protection uh, from international, uh, from variants that might arise uh, from overseas is an important part until we can get to a position where we can be confident in the uh, in vaccine efficacy against all variants, uh, not just against the current variants that are, uh, that are uh, here in large numbers in the UK. Let's head to Northern Ireland with Jim Shannon. Jim Shannon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can I also put on record my thanks to the Secretary of State for all that he and his team are doing uh, in relation to this. Northern Ireland is the only part of the United Kingdom with a land border. As the Secretary of State is aware, the Republic of Ireland are enforcing the very apparent border in Northern Ireland for their safety on their side. It seems, as I said, there can be a border where it sits. However, I am eager to understand what steps have been taken to ensure again as I highlighted last week, that the officials in government have access to pertinent travel information for those coming into Dublin to ensure that the United Kingdom on the Northern Ireland side is also safe. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I spoke to my Irish opposite number, uh, Minister Donnelly, this morning, and he has assured me that that data uh, will be uh, provided appropriately 
and securely, and we've been working together uh, to ensure that that happens for some time. Uh, as I said in my statement, we've been working with the Irish government uh, to ensure that there is, are appropriate measures, both in the Republic of Ireland and in the United Kingdom, to ensure that the, uh, that the border on the island of Ireland uh, can be kept uh, completely open, as it must, yet we have the adequate uh, protection against arrivals of, of variants of concern internationally. And it is the two countries working together, putting in place similar arrangements, both in the Republic and in the United Kingdom, uh, that will allow us to deliver that, that goal that I'm sure we all share. Felicity Bundy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am increasingly concerned about the effect of lockdown on the mental health of children. I am receiving so many emails from adolescents and teenagers. Will my right honourable friend assure me that when he feeds into the February the 22nd roadmap, that the mental health of children and indeed their parents is taken into account? Uh, yes, of course I will, Mr. Speaker. Right, let us head to Wales with Noel Williams. Noel Williams. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, yesterday, the number of deaths from COVID in Wales passed the grim total of 5,000. Our public health leaders say that the Welsh Government's £500 self-isolation payment is not enough and is indeed an economic driver for people to go to work. Sick pay, on the other hand, is the responsibility of this Government. So will he now commit this government to increasing the paltry level of sick pay at just £96 per week to enable working people to self-isolate safely? Well, Mr Speaker, we have put in place the, the extra £500 uh, for those on low incomes to ensure that everybody can get financial support that they may need while self-isolating. Let's cross over to Peter Alders. Peter Alders. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I commend my honourable, my right honourable friend, for his statement. The Norfolk and Waveney CCG local NHS staff and volunteers are to be commended for rising to a challenge, which on Sunday resulted in 1,000 people being vaccinated at Kirkley Mill in Lowestoft in very difficult weather conditions. There is a plan to significantly increase the number of daily vaccinations for more sites. And so that this can be delivered, can my right honourable friend confirm that there will be a consistent and increased supply of vaccines and that the initial difficulties that some people have experienced with the national online booking system will be ironed out? Yes, absolutely. I want to thank everybody across uh, Norfolk and Waveney for the work they've been doing to roll out this vaccine. Uh, as um, uh, uh, as a, a critical part of the country in terms of the COVID response, uh, the work that's been done locally has been absolutely exemplary. And I commend my honourable friend for the part that he's played uh, and the leadership he's played in Lowestoft uh, in making that happen. The uptake has been superb. Uh, I've seen some of the reports locally uh, and, the, uh, and, and, and the emotional impact it has on people to get vaccinated is absolutely fantastic. And I'll absolutely take away the points that he makes. Let's head up to Yorkshire with Judith Cummins. Judith Cummins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Despite assurances by the Secretary of State and the Minister, it is now clear that the newly imposed NHS dentistry targets are in fact actively undermining patient access to urgent treatments during the pandemic, as I warned they would. Last week, a whistleblower at the UK's largest dental chain with over 600 practices, my dentist, sent me an internal memo that advised them to prioritise routine checkups over treatments in order to meet the new targets. So will the Secretary of State look at this urgently and agree to revise these targets to ensure that they do not undermine patient care, as currently the system as it stands incentivises routine checkups above those in severe pain? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I want to thank our nation's dentists who've worked incredibly hard to get dentistry services going again. It is very important uh, that we uh, support them and that the financial incentives underpin the need uh, to restart as much as is possible. It is, of course, challenging to deliver dentistry services uh, with the, uh, given that there are so many aerosol generating procedures. Uh, and I will ask the dentistry minister 
uh, to uh, speak to the Honourable Lady and perhaps meet with her uh, to discuss these ongoing challenges. Let's head down to Henry Smith. Henry Smith. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I support the introduction of targeted quarantine for those passengers coming from high-risk COVID-19 variant countries. Uh, but uh, will he also commit to regular reviews and even a sunset clause on these regulations as later in the year we seek to get our economy restarted and support our aviation sector? Um, Mr Speaker, I don't underestimate the impact that all of these measures have had on Gatwick. And as the, uh, as the Honourable Gentleman represents so many of those who work at Gatwick, uh, I, I understand the impact. I was, I was at Gatwick Airport on Friday uh, and to see the, uh, the empty departure hall uh, was really quite, uh, it was quite a sad sight. Um, it, these measures are necessary in my view and I'm glad that he uh, supports them, difficult as they are. But we are also acutely cognizant of the economic impact on the, on the airports and of course uh, the impact on those who work in them. Uh, and I'd be very happy to keep talking to him about how quickly we can remove these measures safely. Let's go over to Diane Abbott. Diane Abbott. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I mean, the whole House has welcomed what the Secretary of State has had to say about the progress in fighting coronavirus. But he will be aware that there is a very real danger that one cohort will be left behind, and that is black and ethnic minority communities. We already know that black people were four times more likely to die from coronavirus, and currently the statistics show that black over 80s are half as likely to be vaccinated as white people. I'm conscious that the vaccine minister, Nadine Zahari, is, is aware of this issue, but will the Secretary of State give the House an undertaking that he will drive forward a whole series of measures in order to increase vaccine take up amongst black and minority ethnic persons. It would be a, tra a tragedy when black and minority ethnic people are on the front line of, of the fight against coronavirus as health and social care workers, if there was an increased death toll because enough wasn't being done to encourage take up of the vaccine. So state. Mr. Speaker, I don't say this lightly, but I agree with every single word that the Right Honourable Lady said. Uh, and I want to pay tribute to her because I haven't had the chance in the House to thank all of those, uh, uh, the members of the House, all colleagues, uh, who took part in the incredibly moving video from, uh, from black MPs uh, on the, in order to persuade people who may have understandable concerns that taking the jab is the right thing to do. Uh, she played a pivotal role in that uh, short video, uh, and it is just one small part of the huge effort we need to go to, because the fewer people who don't have the protection, uh, the safer we will all be. And I'm very grateful for her work, her support, uh, and I hope that we can continue to work together to drive uptake amongst black communities right across this country. Okay. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, policies are often easy to announce and difficult to end. Uh, I listened carefully to the answer the Secretary of State gave to my uh, honourable friend who chairs the Transport Select Committee. The Chief Scientific Advisor says that COVID is with us forever. Uh, it will presumably continue to mutate into new variants forever. And I listened carefully to the answer to the question, um, but I didn't hear it. When is this policy going to end, if ever? Because if the virus continues to mutate, surely the risk is going to be there forever. And so when can it be removed? The risk of, the, uh, of mutations uh, absolutely can and will be managed uh, through the uh, evolution of vaccines in the way that the annual flu jab changes each year and allows us to protect ourselves. Of course, these measures, uh, whilst necessary now, um, are not measures that can be in place permanently. We need to replace them over time with a system of safe and free international travel. 
That's where we need to get to. The first task is to vaccinate the population. Um, it, it, the, if, if we get good news on the vaccination impact on hospitalizations and deaths uh, from people who have the uh, from a from new new mutations, then we will be in a better uh, place. If we do not get such good news, then we will need to use the updated vaccines uh, to protect against uh, the uh, variants of concern. The scientists inform and advise me that there are repeatedly, independently around the world, um, mutations of the same type in the E484K area of the virus, as mentioned by the Honourable Gentleman opposite. Now, that gives the scientists a good start in where to target the new updated vaccine. But it, it may, that is um, if we have to wait until then. It may be that we get enough efficacy from the existing vaccines uh, against hospitalization and death uh, that they work perfectly well uh, to hold this down. We just don't know that yet, hence the precautionary principle applies. That's said Luton with Rachel Hopkins. Rachel Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's hugely important that we keep progressing with tackling the virus and vaccinations. However, last week I heard from the Catch Up With Cancer campaign, whose research indicates it would take cancer services working at 120% capacity for two years to catch up with the existing backlog. So I'm very concerned that the Cancer Recovery Task Force lacks sufficient resources and scope to achieve restoration of services and to tackle the backlog. So will the government in March's budget increase the resources available to the task force to expand the overall capabilities of the UK's cancer services to tackle the backlog? Uh, Mr Speaker, we announced in the spending review significant extra funding to tackle the backlogs. I'm, I'm very proud of cancer services across the country who have kept up the work during this uh, second uh, wave um, in a way that has been quite uh, remarkable due to tenacity, working together, flexibility and, of course, very, very strong infection prevention and control. I was at the Royal Marsden last week uh, where they are doing 100% of their normal time uh, operations. That isn't uh, true everywhere. They have the advantage of being a, a, a essentially cancer-only site, which makes things um, easier. Uh, so I would say that the thrust of her question is right, that we absolutely ma must catch up on the, uh, the cancer backlog. But I'm, I'm optimistic because people have worked so hard in oncology to keep cancer services going. Uh, and as the number of COVID patients comes down, so we must ensure that the, uh, that the backlog is worked through. Well, there Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I pay tribute to everybody in Stockport who's part of the massive uh, vaccination effort, which is going uh, so well as it is indeed across the rest of the country? Well, can I ask my right honourable friend uh, th this question? The original uh, purpose of lockdown was to uh, keep uh, hospitals from falling over and to uh, reduce hospitalisations. So if that is achieved through a vaccination programme, is it now the government's intention to use the uh, level of virus in circulation, the number of cases in the population, as a determination as when to ease lockdown? Uh, no, the Prime Minister set out the four conditions that need to be met, and he'll be saying more about this on the 22nd of February. Let's head to Clive Efford. Clive Efford. <laughs> I'd like to add my congratulations to all those involved in the rollout of the uh, vaccine, particularly those in, in my local area who've been working nonstop. Um, but uh, can I ask the Secretary of State to say something about international cooperation, particularly in identifying uh, new variants and assisting those countries in stopping their, their transmission? Uh, what, what discussions are, are there with the World Health Organization and others to in, ensure that? Uh, we are keeping track of new variants as much as is practicably possible. It, this is a critical question. Uh, there's three things that I point to. The first is that we have uh, put in place the new variant assessment platform, uh, which uses our genomic capability to, uh, be, to be of service to countries that don't have that capability to be able to identify uh, variants and to sequence uh, samples if that's needed. The second is working with the health, World Health Organization uh, to ensure that their library of variants is as up to date as possible. And of course, it's from that work, the, the assessment of what the appropriate updates to any vaccine is necessary must flow. And that's how it works with flu. Um, that system is nascent, but incredibly important 
And I'm grateful to the World Health Organization for the work they've done on it so far, and we need to go further. And the third is that the measures put in place today by testing every international arrival, given the nature of the UK, even in these tough times as, a, as an international uh, hub, uh, means that we will, where we spot positives, be able to then uh, sequence them and therefore be able to gather the sequences of, uh, of um, coronavirus uh, from around the world. And so this, the announcements today will directly help us to address the question of where variants of concern are arising uh, and therefore help the international efforts to tackle them. Let's head to Staffordshire with Aaron Bell. Aaron Bell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the Secretary of State for his statement. And I join him in praising everyone involved in the vaccine rollout. Uh, it's going incredibly well in Newcastle under Lyme. And in Staffordshire, we've just passed 200,000 vaccinations given. Brilliant scientists in the UK and around the world have delivered us these vaccines at an unprecedented pace. And I welcome the news they're now working on new versions of them against variants. However, if we were to embrace even faster methods for evaluating the efficacy of vaccines, such as challenge trials, we could potentially speed up that process even further. Given the enormous economic cost of lockdowns, every month counts, and I think this should prompt the whole world to reevaluate our standard methodology for approving vaccines. So could my right honourable friend set out what steps he is taking to allow new varieties of vaccines to be developed as quickly as possible if they prove to be required? State. Yes, Mr. Speaker, we don't rule out challenge studies at all, and uh, we're working with Oxford uh, University on uh, such an approach. Um, and uh, more broadly, uh, I am up for, uh, for considering anything that can ensure that a vaccine can safely be brought to, uh, brought to bear and to support this effort as fast as possible. I would, though, um, caution against um, undue pessimism in this space because the MHRA has done an amazing job at maintaining very strong safety and efficacy requirements whilst speeding up every process and constantly challenging the critical path to vaccine approval and asking how it can be sped up whilst maintaining the very, very high standards uh, that they should expect. They are continuing to do that work with potential iterations of the vaccine um, to ensure that the level of assuredness is appropriate uh, and that the degree of checks that are that an iteration needs to go through is appropriate to the degree of difference from the original vaccine. For instance, in flu, you don't need to go through the full clinical trials process because the underlying platform is known to be safe. You need to demonstrate clinical efficacy. Uh, and uh, it's that sort of, um, of, of flexible yet rigorous thinking that the MHRA uh, should be very proud of. Stephanie Peacock. Thank you, Mr. So people are at home with the windows closed and the heating on. These are potential conditions for carbon monoxide poisoning, which has very similar symptoms to that of COVID-19. So can I ask what the government is doing to enforce legislation on this issue and make the public aware of this silent killer? Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Lady raises a very important point, uh, which is taken into account in the work that we're doing to push forward high quality ventilation. Uh, which is good for tackling carbon monoxide poisoning uh, and also uh, for trying to reduce the risk of the spread of COVID. Now we go to Wellingborough. Peter Bowen. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And uh, could I start by thanking the Secretary of State, the hard-working Secretary of State, for yet again coming to the House and updating us on the COVID situation. We have a particular problem in North Northamptonshire with COVID infections. We just cannot get them down. In uh, Wellingborough, we are 25% above the national average. In Kettering, we are 50% above the national average. And in Corby, we are more than double the national average and have the highest infection rate in the country. I wonder whether the Secretary of State has given any consideration to the mass testing of North Northamptonshire so we can get infections down, rather as happened in Liverpool. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm aware of and also worried about the continued high rates of infections in North North Hans, um, which, um, which hasn't had a particularly bad uh, pandemic uh, thus far, but now at this point seems to have a stubbornly high infection rate. And I'm absolutely up for all measures which might help to get it down, including mass testing, 
and I will take that idea away, work with it with colleagues, and then return to the uh, honourable gentleman and his North North Arts colleagues uh, with a proposal. Now we go to Jonathan Edwards. Dear Madam Deputy Speaker, the pandemic has been particularly difficult for those with a weak immune system. I therefore welcome that UKRI have provided funding to support research on vaccine responses in groups of immune suppressed individuals, such as high risk cancer patients. When does the Secretary of State expect that the JCVI will have enough data to develop a vaccine protection strategy for immunosuppressed individuals? which details whether there are any specific vaccines preferred for this cohort. Uh, yes, this is a very important uh, consideration for those for whom the vaccine is clinically inappropriate. Clearly, the single most important thing is that everybody else gets the vaccine because that's what can best uh, keep them safe. So when we say that the vaccine is good for you and good for others, that includes those who are clinically unable to take the vaccine to protect themselves. So everybody around them needs to take the vaccine in order to protect uh, them. More broadly, that work is underway, and I will ask the Deputy Chief Medical Officer to write to the Honourable Gentleman uh, in order to set out the precise clinical details. Now we go to Derbyshire. Hello, Huida. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I thank my right honourable friend for his statement. Having so many constituents working in the aviation industry, this is important information. As well as being thankful for the now ramped up provision of vaccine centres uh, in South Derbyshire, um, how will my right honourable friend ensure that housebound residents receive their jab, as there seems to be gaps in communications between the PCNs, district health services and GP surgeries, leaving my constituents unsure? I'll look into the specifics of the situation in uh, South Derbyshire and ask the Minister for Vaccine Deployment to call her uh, to, um, uh, uh, to, to try to understand the situation precisely uh, in her area. Um, it is absolutely the responsibility of PCNs to deliver vaccines to the housebound. It is that, that is working in, uh, in most parts of the country. I haven't heard of any concerns in South Derbyshire, but it is obviously incredibly important because these are some of the most vulnerable people to COVID in the country. And we must make sure that everybody, including those who are housebound, uh, have the offer of a, of a jab uh, and that people can get out and, and make that happen. Now we go to Ayrshire, Patricia Gibson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. New border restrictions to safeguarders from COVID will, of course, mean a reduction in the amount of travel into the UK, which will, of course, cause further harm to aviation and travel firms. Can the Secretary of State update us on the progress and give us more details about the ongoing Cabinet discussion, discussions regarding specific support for aviation and travel firms in the light of these additional measures? Yes, we don't underestimate the impact of these measures on the uh, travel and aviation industries. Uh, my right hand friend, the Transport Secretary, uh, is leading those discussions, as he has done throughout. Uh, because it is, it is incredibly important uh, that people get the right level of uh, support. Uh, but it also comes to the point that my uh, right honourable friend, the member for the Forest of Dean said, uh, which is we need to ensure that we go into these measures with a plan for how we come out of them uh, into a set of secure international travel uh, arrangements uh, so, that, uh, so that people can get moving again. Jonathan Gullis. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. In Stoke-on-Trent, Kidsgrove and Talk, I've seen firsthand whilst volunteering at the Mass Vaccination Centre in Tunstall, the incredible efforts of our local NHS heroes getting jabs into the arms of up to 1,000 people each day. This is important as the Royal Stoke University Hospital has been under tremendous pressure in critical care, dealing with capacity 220% above their usual averages. So will my right honourable friend thank the local health and care heroes across Stoke-on-Trent, Kidsgrove and Talk and give assurance that we will get increased vaccine doses as the supply of it increases. Uh, yes, absolutely. I think the effort in Stoke has been absolutely magnificent. And um, I follow it uh, particularly closely, Madam Deputy Speaker, because for all the times that I come to this chamber, and it is normally uh, at, at least once a week, I'm always grilled from, by a, a, a colleague from Stoke. 
uh, about the performance in Stoke. Um, and I've been looking at it recently, I think across Stoke, both in the hospital, the GPs and the pharmacies have been doing a magnificent job in the vaccination effort. And I'm grateful to my honourable friend uh, for his leadership locally in promoting uptake. Now we go to Leeds, Hilary Benn. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Given the evidence that some of the new variants of COVID are much more transmissible, the RCN and the BMA have raised concerns about whether current PPE guidance is adequate. And it has been reported that some hospitals are offering staff high-grade PPE, for example, FFP3 masks, while others are not, which means unequal levels of protection depending on where staff work. Can the Secretary of State tell us whether the NHS has reviewed the guidance about the standard of PPE to be provided to all staff when treating COVID-19 pathway, medium and high risk patients? Uh, yes, I asked for specific advice on this when we saw the increased transmissibility of the, uh, of the B1.17 uh, strain, the so-called uh, Kent variant. Uh, and this exactly this question was reviewed as he would expect of me. I follow clinical advice on PPE guidance and the clinical advice remains unchanged. Andrew Griffith. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And may I thank my right honourable friend for coming to the House with his statement today. Would he join me in congratulating the Henfield heroes uh, at Henfield Medical Centre? They've already vaccinated over a thousand patients who very much appreciated not having to travel 14 miles to the previous clinic in Storrington. And I'm grateful that artificial limits on the number of centres per primary care network have been relaxed in rural areas. Yes, I, I pay tribute to everybody at the Henfield Health Centre who are doing the, this incredible work. Uh, it's really uplifting being in a health centre. If, if, if you haven't been to uh, to a vaccination centre as a, as, a, as a member of this house, I would highly recommend it uh, because it is it's such an uplifting experience. And I'm really glad that it's being carried out ever closer to home for people as we expand the number of, uh, of vaccination sites, uh, which are now over 1,400 across England. Now we go to Cardiff, Kevin Brennan. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The maximum sentence for lying on your locator form will be 10 years in prison. What will the minimum sanction be for that offence? And the cost of the hotel, including testing and transport, will be £750 for 10 days. Can you give the House an absolute assurance that that represents good value for money to passengers uh, and that there's no undue profiteering? Uh, yes, absolutely. Of course, one of the things that we've been uh, doing in our discussions with uh, hotel groups and others is ensuring value for money as much as possible for passengers uh, and, um, and, and hence we've managed to get the cost down to £1,750 for, a, uh, for an individual uh, travelling in a room alone. Sir Desmond Swain, will he maintain his war aim of protecting the NHS and eschew those siren voices calling for a desired level of infection within the community. If we depart from a level of hospitalization with which the NHS can cope effectively, we will lose the proper sense of urgency to lift restrictions that are so devastating and, cost and costly to us all. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's right to raise the issue of the uh, level of hospitalization as one of the key factors and conditions for exit as set out by the Prime Minister. Um, the good news is that number of people in hospital with COVID is now falling. Um, it is still higher than either at the April peak or at the November peak. Um, the, the challenge in terms of the number of cases is that when cases are very high, um, you are more likely to get a new variant, but thankfully cases are coming down very sharply too. We now go to Yvette Cooper. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Yesterday, the Home Secretary told me in Parliament that 100% compliance checks were now taking place at the border. 
Yet one passenger arriving at Heathrow yesterday from South Africa via Qatar has reported having no checks on her forms or tests and being just sent on her way through passport e-gates, a problem that I raised with the Prime Minister almost a month ago. Travellers have reported throughout that the reality is not matching the government's rhetoric. So why, when this is so important, does it appear that the most basic checks are still not happening? Uh, the Home Secretary is looking into this individual case and the measures that we announced today further strengthen the enforcement uh, to make sure that the rules uh, that are currently in place are enforced more strongly and indeed that we br have brought in a new system of rules uh, to strengthen the safeguards at our border yet further. We now go to Bridge End. Dr Jamie Wallace. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Could I also just say a huge thank you to everyone on the front line working hard on the vaccine rollout in Bridgend and Fourth Gore. But when it comes to dealing with the transmission of the South African variants, could my right honourable friend set out what steps he is taking on surge testing so we can gather more information and effectively monitor any further community transmission? Yes, when we see the community transmission of a variant of concern, uh, then we send in extra testing um, and the sequencing of all the positives to try to find any other variant of concern nearby. So that means uh, going door to door to, uh, to offer testing. It means going and having enhanced contact tracing. So anybody who tests positive and making sure that we test all those around who they've been in contact with uh, and in some cases, test the contacts of those contacts uh, in turn. Um, the, uh, uh, this is currently underway in a number of locations uh, in, in targeted areas. Uh, and of course, I speak regularly with the Welsh government uh, to ensure we take the same sort of approach over the border. And we now go to Dulwich, to Helen Hayes. We have a problem on the, uh, we have a problem. Let's see if it quickly can be solved. Uh, is that Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Vaccine hesitancy is highest amongst black, Asian and minority ethnic residents and tackling it is vital to stop the existing health inequalities of COVID-19 from widening and deepening further. My constituency has one of the most ethnically diverse populations in the country, yet neither of my local councils, Lambeth and Southwark, was included on the seemingly arbitrary list of councils invited to bid for additional funding to address vaccine hesitancy. Can the Secretary of State explain why, and will he commit to working with the Community Secretary to look again urgently at this decision? Uh, it's the Minister for Vaccine Rollout, Minister Zahawi, who is leading these efforts. Uh, and it's obviously an incredibly important subject uh, because it matters to us all. Steve Bryan. State said earlier that the virus treats us all the same, which is of course quite right. And, and sadly, it doesn't go easy on those who don't take up the offer of a vaccine. So can I ask my right honourable friend what his thinking is, if despite all the excellent work going on to support the vaccine hesitant, and there is lots of it, we have fellow citizens not protected. And will he confirm that such a personal decision cannot impact on the ultimate release of our society and our economy? Well, we're not proposing to mandate vaccination uh, for the, partly for the reasons that he sets out. Um, and anyway, vaccine take up has been really very high and much higher than expected, which is terrific. And in fact, in the international surveys, the UK now, in the latest surveys I've seen, in the, the UK now has the highest enthusiasm for taking the vaccine up from about fifth a couple of months ago. Our attitude and our tone and our communications throughout have been purposefully entirely positive about why it is good for you, why it's good for your community and how people like you are taking the vaccine. Uh, and I want to praise the Government Communication Service and NHS England and local councils who've worked so hard on this uh, to drive vaccine take up as high as it has been. And now we go to Lewisham, Vicky Foxcroft. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. 
To date, government communication with the 2.2 million people who have been shielding on and off for almost a year has been poor. On their behalf, I asked the Secretary of State a very simple question today. Will it be safe to stop shielding after they've received their second dose of the vaccine? Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I, I'm afraid I don't agree with the uh, Honourable Lady uh, one bit. Uh, we write regularly to those who are shielding uh, and we write to them individually so I'm not going to make a blanket announcement in this chamber. Uh, we're going to communicate carefully and individually with people who are on the shielded patient list. It is too sensitive to play politics with. Now we go to Pinner. David Simmons. Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, may I commend my right hon. Friend on his decision to fund the local authorities of Harrow and Hillingdon, which serve my constituency, to reach out to people who may be reluctant to come forward and get their vaccine. May I ask my right hon. friend, will he consider, in respect of those who are in our country with an uncertain immigration status, but who it is vital for both humanitarian and medical reasons that we get vaccinated, will he consider a similar approach, funding local authorities who know their communities best, to reach out to those people and ensure that they are also part of this great British success story? Um, yes, we're working with uh, with both uh, GPs and community parts of the NHS uh, and also with local authorities to do this. Uh, and as he may have seen, uh, the Home Office uh, has, has stated uh, that the most important thing is that we vaccinate everybody who is uh, present here, uh, whatever their uh, status or paperwork. Patrick Gray. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm very glad to hear that exchange because it's a considerable issue in Glasgow with the large asylum-seeking population that we have as well. So I wonder if he could also say how his announcements today about quarantining uh, will be applied to people who arrive in this country seeking asylum and probably don't have £1,750 in their back pocket. How will uh, new arrivals be supported in the quarantine process? A new arrival uh, to the UK who's been in a red list country in the last 10 days uh, who is not a resident of uh, the United Kingdom or of Ireland uh, or a UK uh, citizen uh, will be denied entry uh, and it will be uh, held in a, um, in a in hotel quarantine uh, until they can return to the country from which they have arrived. I'm endeavouring to make sure that everyone on the list gets a chance to ask a question, but they won't if we don't speed up a bit because we have a lot more uh, a lot more business to come to. No, I don't criticise the Secretary of State. If he has complicated answers, uh, complicated questions, he has to give complicated answers. So let's have quick and simple questions, and then we can have quick and simple answers. Jack Brereton. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I join my neighbouring North Staffordshire colleagues in thanking our health workers for their amazing, the amazing job they've been doing locally in rolling out vaccines? Would my right honourable friend join me in encouraging everyone in Stoke-on-Trent in the one to four priority groups to get an appointment and get their job before the 15th of February? Uh, yes, Stoke-on-Trent uh, Stoke has again, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, been represented in this discussion uh, so, uh, so ably and uh, effectively, and everybody across Stoke deserves praise for the work that they're doing, driving up vaccination rate, because the higher the vaccination rate, the quicker and more safely we can all come out of this together. And now we go to Rhonda. Chris Bryant. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. The rollout of the vaccine programme has been absolutely commendable, brilliant, well done. Um, and locally, it's been really encouraging to see the mass vaccination centres are working alongside the GP surgeries. But I'm really worried that from this Friday onwards, all the mass vaccination centres locally will have to close because there won't be any more Pfizer vaccine apart from for the delivery of second doses. And that won't start for another fortnight. On top of that, the number of AstraZeneca doses available locally will fall from 24,000 a week to 8,000 a week. So I'm really worried that the next cohort of people are not going to get their vaccinations soon. Is there anything the Secretary of State can do to make sure that we get more vaccines locally by this weekend? 
Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of the closure of any vaccination centres. Of course, it's a matter for the, uh, for the Welsh Government if they're going to close vaccination centres. But I speak to, my, uh, to the Welsh uh, Health Minister uh, regularly, and this hasn't been raised as an issue of concern. Uh, supply is, of course, the rate limiting factor, as it has been throughout the rollout. Uh, supply uh, continues. We do have to start ensuring that we have those second jabs ready uh, for people to get their uh, second jab. Uh, but I'm not aware of the issue that he's raised. It's certainly not a, a, an issue that uh, is, uh, uh, is a problem across um, England, where I'm directly responsible for the, uh, for the rollout. And so far, this program has been going so well across the whole United Kingdom, and we've all been working so hard together to make it happen. Sir Edward Lee. In warmly welcoming what the Secretary said, say, have said today, uh, I think what the question I've got to ask many people is why didn't we do this over a year ago? You know, we are an island. If we'd done what the Australians and New Zealanders have done, we, perhaps we wouldn't have had to close our schools all this time. So I'm saying this to support the Secretary of State. When he's locked in cabinet discussions with people who say we've got to protect the travel industry or the aircraft industry, let's have tough quarantine regimes like Australia and New Zealand Let's have tough, enforced local lockdowns like China. Let's get a grip on this rather than just saying that it's more important to keep the travel industry open rather than our schools. Secretary of State. Well, I'm, I'm very grateful for the support from my right honourable friend uh, in, in the, way that he, the way that he puts it. I have been talking to my Australian uh, counterpart about the, uh, the approach that they take, not least because their hotel quarantine has now been in place for some time. And the central point that he makes is that once we get cases down through the, both the measures now and then the vaccine here to keep them down, um, then a, a tough borders policy can help to keep us free domestically. And I think that's a very important part of this consideration. And so to Liverpool, to Kim Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I start by paying tribute to all organisations in Liverpool working on the front line to manage this pandemic? Now, does the Secretary of State believe the government is following its own guidance and making over 2,000 DBLA workers physically attend the workplace for non-essential work, processing provision applications while driving lessons are not possible under current restrictions? And would he agree with me that no one is safe until we are all safe? Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I know my right honourable friend, the Transport Secretary, has looked into the issue that she raises about uh, DVLA, and I know that Public Health Wales have been involved uh, in, uh, in advising a DVLA, uh, which of course is based in Swansea. Wimbledon. Stephen Hammond. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I congratulate my right honourable friend and all those in the local health service and volunteers rolling out the successful vaccine programme in Wimbledon? I agree we have a part to play, and I agree that we need effective border security. But my right honourable friend said earlier that new variants could emerge anywhere. So could he allay my concerns that our efforts might not be better spent on ensuring effective, rigorous and enforced home quarantine for all, rather than setting up a hotel regime which will only uh, protect against red list countries? Well, the rigour and the security of both the home quarantine and the hotel quarantine are important. And it's a matter of the, the degree of risk. Uh, and that's why we've attempted to strike this, uh, the balance that we have. But what, what isn't in balance is the need for rigorous quarantine, both from um, those coming from red list countries and those coming from all other countries who quarantine at home. Uh, it is important that that takes place, uh, whether it's at home or in a hotel, and hence the stronger enforcement measures. And now we go to Barbara Keeley. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. One of my constituents is a long-term inpatient in the Spinal Injuries Unit at Southport Hospital. He is 70 years old and is tetraplegic. Despite there being COVID cases on the ward, he has not yet received a vaccine, and staff tell his partner they have no idea when they will be able to offer one to him. Vulnerable patients in units like this may be there for months or years. So can the Secretary of State set out what he is doing to ensure that all long-term inpatients, including my constituent, get the vaccine at the same time as they would if they were an outpatient? Uh, yes, that's exactly the principle on which we uh, are proceeding. 
Uh, I pay tribute to the work that uh, the Honourable Lady does in this area and always speaking up uh, for those who are in inpatient care. Uh, and um, it, it's very important that we make sure that there is equal and fair support for all according to clinical need. And that will be addressed in the next phase of the rollout uh, once we've um, ensured that the offer to all those in categories one to four uh, is achieved by next month. And so to Newbury, Laura Farris. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to put on record my thanks to um, everybody working at Newbury Racecourse for leading a fantastic vaccination programme through my constituency. Um, I welcome my right honourable friend's statement about the very high rate of take up of the vaccine. Could he tell the House what the rate of take up has been among those under the age of 70 who've been offered it so far? And also what conversations he's had with the vaccine minister about dispelling one of the most persistent myths that's been raised with me by young women, that the vaccine um, could negatively affect their fertility. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. There is no evidence at all uh, that the vaccine negatively affects uh, fertility. And there are many myths about vaccines, and I'm very glad to say that they have largely been uh, rightly ignored when they are inaccurate uh, by the British public. Um, the way we try to tackle these myths is by putting out as much uh, positive, accurate, objective information from objective sources, uh, both on the NHS website and, of course, the Chief Medical Officer and Deputy Chief Medical Officers uh, answering questions whenever possible. So I'm very glad that she's raised this uh, particular issue and I will ask one of the Deputy Chief Medical Officers to write to her and we will publish that letter to provide further reassurance that she asks for. And so to Exeter, Ben Bradshaw. What exactly is his exit strategy from his quarantine policy? Is he, for example, planning airport testing, GPS tracking and COVID passports like other European countries if we're to avoid the total collapse of our vital travel sector? Thank you. I'd refer to the question, I, the answer I gave to my uh, right honourable friend earlier, but uh, absolutely testing is a, a very important part of, uh, uh, of this, uh, as I set out in the statement. Now to Beaconsfield, to Joy Morrissey. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I know that my right honourable friend is committed to securing our borders. Will he therefore commis consider commissioning and funding airlines and airports directly to run these new Department of Health passenger and border restrictions? Airlines and airports like BA and Heathrow have the experience and market innovation and incentive to deliver safe travel for Britain. Will my right honourable friend meet with me and representatives from the airline industry so together we can de deliver secure borders, but a global Britain? That is exactly our, our goal, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, and we've been working very hard with the, uh, the carriers and the, uh, and the airports, the airport operators, to put this, uh, re this new scheme in place. And there's further work to do over the, over the days ahead. Uh, and, uh, and, and no doubt after its initial introduction on Monday. What I'd say very directly to my honourable friend, uh, to the airline industry and to the airports is that I know that this is very difficult and tough. It is absolutely vital that we all work together constructively, positively, and with the spirit of innovation that she describes in order to make sure that we can put in place a system that is both robust, but also uses all possible technology to make sure that we have the, uh, the, the basis of a future safe global travel arrangement. And it is both about securing uh, the borders now, and it, but it is also about making sure uh, that we can get global travel going for the long term. And now to Lighthouse, and Sanna Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Last week, the London Director of Public Health England, Professor Kevin Fenton, said that London's Asian communities have been the hardest hit 
by the COVID-19 second wave. This is being felt so deeply within my constituency and I pay tribute to the work of those on the front line in my constituency in helping drive up the vaccine uptake, as well as those on the front line, including those serving in our mortuary and funeral services. I'm sure the Secretary of State can agree that there is a need for the government to learn quickly from the impact of the first and second waves on uh, minority communities. But in order to do so, this must be informed by evidence, especially in order to ensure effectiveness of any vaccine hesitancy strategy. So can the Secretary of State advise whether he and his colleagues will ensure that data on both vaccine rollout as well as mortalities in the second wave will be published regularly in a meaningful format and disaggregated by ethnicity. Thank you. Before I ask the Secretary of State to answer the question, I, I give notice to, we ought to be stopping this statement now, but I have seven more people who wish to get in. Tell them, can you please just cut your bits of paper in half and ask a question because it's not fair to everybody else. And people who are sitting at home are not getting the atmosphere. We've got to do this quickly. We don't need speeches just questions. If people take more than 20 seconds, I will cut them off. Secretary of State. The answer, Madam Deputy Speaker, is yes. Thank you. We now go to Peterborough, to Paul Bristow. Thank you. We now go... No, no, we don't. We go to Rupa Huck. <laughs> Deputy Speaker. The jury's still out on whether every vaccine can eliminate every COVID variant, but we do know that vitamin D builds immunity to all viruses. So when there's a four month free supply that he is promising to the vulnerable, how come nobody's heard of it? Can he commit before the deadline next week to apply that he widely advertises this and the benefits to all Brits? Yes, indeed, I, I have. And I've written to over a million people about the uh, availability of uh, vitamin D. And indeed, I know that that offer is being taken up because there are members of this house who have received their free vitamin C, D, taken a photograph of it and sent me the photo. <laughs> now to Peterborough, Paul Bristow. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The ministerial team and our NHS have done a phenomenal job of vaccinating our most vulnerable and our frontline health and social care workers. But my right honourable friend... Order! Order! We've had that bit. We just need the question. ...be aware that autistic people and those with learning disabilities are vulnerable to COVID-19. The death rate is 4.1 times higher than the general population. Will the Minister use his influence to make sure the JCVI properly considers the right time for autistic people to be prioritised for vaccination? <laughs> Uh, yes, I will. The Honourable Gentleman rightly raises a very important subject, and I'll make sure that that is properly taken into account. Now to offer ban to Carla Lockett. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I thank the Secretary of State for his statement. There will be significant concern amongst the population of Northern Ireland that entry into the UK could continue through Dublin. This puts people in my constituency at additional risk of new variants. Does the Secretary of State agree that this is not behaviour becoming of a good neighbour? In fact, it is quite shameful and irresponsible for the government in the Irish Republic to refuse to share arrivals data with the UK. Furthermore, if this continues, does he agree that the hard border currently being enforced by the Irish Republic, restricting travel from north to, north to south, will also have to be enforced by the PSNI to stop entrance into Northern Ireland from across the border to protect Thanks. the UK? No, I don't agree with the Honourable Lady, and I want to reassure every one of her constituents and all citizens across Northern Ireland that we're working very closely with the government in Dublin to ensure that data is shared properly and that both governments have an appropriate system to safeguard our borders against the challenges that we face and to allow for the free, uh, free travel within the common travel area. Chris Green. I welcome my uh, right honourable friend's commitment to uh, make a contribution in terms of the understanding of the impact on mental health of children and families to the roadmap on the 22nd of February. We really commit to publishing that in advance to make sure that parents know that all of their concerns are being addressed and they have an opportunity to make a contribution to it. I will look into the suggestion that my uh, honourable friend makes. Now to St Albans, to Daisy Cooper. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. 
the head of the government's own test and trace system has been admitted that up to 20,000 people per day who are asked to self-isolate are not doing so. Can, so can the Secretary of State please confirm after 10 months of asking when he will come up with a plan to fix the isolation system so that those who need to self-isolate have the pastoral and financial support they need to do so? We have put in place that support, £500 for all those on low incomes. So everybody who's asked to self-isolate needs to self-isolate to break the chains of transmission. Robert Goodwill. Thank you. Well, what lessons can we learn from Israel that uniquely is ahead of us in this race to protect its people? For example, when we reach Group 10, uh, the group of below 50-year-olds uh, who haven't already been injected, should we maybe be prioritising those who haven't been exposed to the disease, who aren't bursting with antibodies so that we can actually protect more people. And incidentally, the Israelis are also injecting uh, 15 and 16 year olds. Uh, have we any, uh, 16 and 17 year olds, any lessons to be learned from that? Uh, we, we, I, I talk to my uh, Israeli counterpart um, regularly and I am impressed by the, uh, by the effort that uh, Israel has delivered on uh, to vaccinate its uh, population. Uh, I'm very happy to look into the detailed points that my right on all friend raises. Now to Brighton, to Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Projections show that some countries in the global south will have to wait until 2023 to achieve widespread vaccination because pharmaceutical monopolies are creating artificial restrictions. Given that no one is safe until everyone is safe, will the Secretary of State use his influence with cabinet colleagues to ensure the government changes its position and backs proposals from India and South Africa to address pharmaceutical monopolies and help ensure that the world can produce enough vaccines for every country as soon as possible. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Lady would get a better hearing if she started on this subject by congratulating AstraZeneca, the British player in this vaccine race, for the fact that it is rolling out its jab with no profit at all it is doing that in order to be able to vaccinate as many people around the world as fast as possible at an affordable cost. That should be our starting point. There would be no vaccines if it wasn't for the global pharmaceutical industry. I pay tribute to all those working in the pharmaceutical sector. There is no way that we would have these jabs were, it, were, it, were a policy followed uh, that disparaged the pharmaceutical sector in the way that she proposed, in the way that the Labour manifesto proposed at the last election. Instead, we should come together to support industry, scientists, the NHS and government. It's a massive team effort. Yeah. And finally, Dr Luke Evans. For phase two, will the health secretary commit to having mental health workers at national vaccine sites? I will absolutely look into the suggestion uh, that he makes, which is all about making sure that we reach out to people at a moment when everybody is going through a process together, or almost everybody, and I hope it is everybody. Uh, so it's a very interesting proposal that I'll take away and hopefully speak to my honourable friend uh, about in the days to come. Thank you very much. There, we did it, and only seven minutes over time. But I thank everybody for going relatively fast, and especially the Secretary of State who has answered 60 questions, yeah, which is yeah. pretty good going. So we now come to the 10 minute rule motion. Peter Kyle. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I beg to move that leave be given to bring in a bill to make provision about the duties and responsibilities of the Victim Commissioner and about the Victims Code, to make provision about the rights of victims of persistent antisocial behaviour to require local police forces to prepare victim services plans and take steps in connection with victim representative bodies to establish a duty uh, to report suspected child exploitation by those working in regulated activities, to establish a right of appeal by victims against the decision to cease criminal investigation, to make provision for reviews of open and reopened homicide cases, to make provision for the court procedures relating to vulnerable victims and witnesses and for connected purposes. Madam Deputy Speaker, there is agreement across the House that victims of crime should be more empowered and better supported. Indeed, I should recognise that the current Justice Secretary has promised to deliver a bill of his own. So did his predecessor, and so too did his predecessor's predecessor. They were promises to Parliament, but promises were also made to the public. 
The last three Tory manifestos pledged a law for victims. So the challenge we face isn't getting government to admit there's a problem, it's getting them to do something about it. This is a deadly serious issue with deadly seri serious consequences for delay. In the time that's passed since the Tories first promised a victims bill, there have been a million sexual offences, 350,000 rapes. Because of the broken promises of this government, none of those victims of terrible crime benefited from the statutory rights that they had been promised. We know a bill on the, is on the government's to-do list, but it is not on their priority list. It is for Labour, which is why we've produced a bill for us today. Its origins lie in the work undertaken by Claire Waxman, the Victims Commissioner for London, and my right honourable friend, the member for Holborn and St Pancras. Their pioneering legislative work for victims is reflected in today's bill. Confidence in our system of justice is at an all-time low for victims. Trial failures due to victim issues is at an all-time high, trebling since 2015. Victims are increasingly dropping out of the criminal proceedings. When they look to the future, they see no justice in sight, no hope of closure, so they give up. To these victims, failed by government, no justice is better than the agony of false hope. Just as bad, too many victims say their experience of the criminal justice system was even more traumatizing than the crime itself. Surely the most damning indictment imaginable of current policy. Victims have had codified, right, codified rights since 2003, which have been reviewed, updated, extended several times, including at present. Government is committed to putting those rights on a statutory footing. The Labour Party agrees, and it's an important part. We do it in section, part three, section six of the bill before us today. But this bill goes much further because victims need more than rights. They need the tools to uphold them. Madam Deputy Speaker, I've never met anybody working in any part of the criminal justice system that doesn't care about victims. From first responders to high court judges, people have empathy for, for victims of crime. They care. But individual empathy all too often fails to translate into organisational recognition of victim needs. The pe people aren't the problem, but the system is, and perverse incentives run through it like letters in a stick of rock. By giving power that matters to victims, modernizing our justice system to reflect the value and needs of victims, and inserting consequence in, for failure into the system, this bill makes victims unignorable. Right now, under this government, victims and their needs are ignored, and routinely so. There exists a code of rights, but what happens if they're ignored? Nothing. If we did as the government aspires, which is to simply put the code onto statute, then what will happen if the code is ignored then? Still nothing. Laws only matter if there is a consequence for breaking them, and the same must be true for a victim's law. That's why part, through, part three, section five of this bill will create a register held by the victim's commissioner onto which all individuals named as responsible for a, vi a breach of victim's code must be placed. Any part of the criminal justice system seeking to make an appointment in the top decile of salaries must consult the register. They can see if any applications, any applicants have previously failed to uphold victims' rights. We don't bar recruitment, but doubtless it will be taken into account. But the message is clear. For the first time, there will be consequences for those who ignore victims. For the first time, failing victims will have a career-limiting impact. For rights to have meaning, people need to know they exist. Today, all too often, that just simply isn't the case. 80% of people who suffer crime make their way through the criminal justice system totally unaware there is a code of rights. Right now, there's no fixed point in time when a victim is informed of their rights. There should be, but when? Alleged perpetrators are read their essential rights at the point of arrest, but the victim isn't informed of their rights at the point of becoming a victim. This imbalance needs addressing. This bill places a requirement that victims must be informed of their essential rights at the earliest possible opportunity. The clear expectation of the bill 
is that the moment of, fir of first response is usually the appropriate time to inform victims that they have the right to information, support, and a comprehensive set of legally enforceable rights to support them as victims. For those who think this is too soon, answer the following question. If the moment of becoming a victim isn't the right time to discover you have legally enforceable rights, that you have power, then when is? After a week? Month? Or as it is now for most victims? Never. A powerful code of rights needs a powerful commission to hold the system to account. Dame Vera Baird has, we have, in, in Dame Vera Baird, we have a fearless commissioner, but this bill seeks to boost further the commission's power and authority. The Labour Party doesn't fear statutory bodies with independence. We believe it strengthens our democracy. That's why this bill shifts reporting from ministers to parliament, gives justice select committee power of veto over future commissioner appointments and grants extended freedoms to investigate the criminal justice system and ensure code compliance. This bill also gives power directly to victims. For them, things will be different. No longer will they need an MP to authorize a victim's complaint to the parliamentary ombudsman, an inexcusable barrier, which partly explains by West, less than 20 victims have lodged complaints in the past three years, an insulting number considering the scale of violations. Persistent victims of, social, of antisocial behavior will for the first time be embraced by the code, empowering people to stand up against those who play havoc with the civility everyone has the right to expect from their neighbors and from within their community. Right now, only a minority of victims understand their rights and a fraction will ever exert them. The system ignores infraction, so over time, it has become normalized. With this bill, we modernize our system of justice to